Well, shalom, hello, and welcome to another Torah Pasha lesson. Today's lesson, we will be looking at some of the text in Shmini, the Pasha Shmini, that we find in Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, verse 1, going through to chapter 11, verse 47. And Shmini, Shmini is literally translated as eighth. So when we look at the first verse for this Pasha, we can see here in uh, chapter 9, verse 1, on the eighth day, so Hashemini, it says here, Hashemini, so the eighth, and Bayom here is uh, in day, so we read in the Hebrew, Vayhi Bayom, and it became, and it was, Bayom, on or in, day the eighth, Kara, and called Moshe, La Aharon, La Aharon, to Aharon, U Le Vanav, and to his sons, to Aaron and his sons, Ul Zik, Ne Yisrael, and so to the, and to Ul Zik, Ne, so this is, uh, Zakan is like an elder, so to the elders of Yisrael. So Shemini is all about the eighth day, and what is the eighth day? Just before I really delve into what I want to talk about today, the eighth day speaks about the the day of the where the the Kohen has now been inaugurated over a seven day period, and following those seven days, the eighth day, which is really interesting, the Kohen in this case. Our uh, Aharon, the brother of Moshe, is now released to begin performing his tasks as a servant of Hashem, serving in the Mishkan. And there's something quite remarkable about the using the language of the eighth day. So the, the question is asked, why did Hashem in the Torah need to say on the eighth day? Why didn't he just say, after seven days, on Aharon began, or Moshe called to Aharon and to the elders of Israel. Why did he have to specifically use the term the eighth day? And what's quite wonderful about this is that the eighth day speaks of that which is beyond the natural. So the service of the Mishkan and going into the Mishkan the tabernacle, the and what would become the base hamikdash, the, the the temple that Shlomo Hamelik built, there is there is an otherworldly element that takes priority when we enter that environment. We're coming into the domain of Hashem, the where the Shekinah, the Shekinah, dwell the dwelling of the dwelling presence of Hashem. It is preeminent. Preeminent, and we can see this as well in previous verses where it talks about the Moshe himself when he's going through the process, the seven-day process of setting up and instructing Aharon and beginning the inauguration process of the Kohen. That he comes to the end of that, and the glory of Hashem fills the Mishkan, and Moshe can't enter. Because it is, a, it is a statement that this place is not natural. There's nothing natural about this. Yet the hand of man is involved in the construction of such a place. Again, I talk about this idea of the fusion of heaven and earth. And this is the Mishkan. The Mishkan is the, a tangible witness of that reality. That there is... And there can be within creation a place of meeting where a nation, where a, a group, a congregation of people can gather and can witness this fusion and can take part of this fusion of heaven and earth and interact in this arena that is beyond the natural yet is somehow within the natural. It's a wonderful, beautiful paradox and I love it. And if you want to delve more deeper into the idea of the numerics of eight, then you just need to go and look at the letter Chet. And the letter Chet will talk a lot about these 
idea. So this is the idea of the eighth day. It's that which is beyond the natural. Seven days uh, speak of the, the cycle of creation, the seven day period. But then there's this eighth day, which is after that. It's beyond it. It's outside it, yet connected to it. It's wonderful. So there's many, uh, many things within this Pasha that speak to that idea. And I encourage you to go beyond what I'm going to be teaching here in this lesson and really begin to delve into this Pasha yourself to see this concept to see this, let's, let's call it an invitation, an invitation beyond what we know, what we are comfortable with even, into something that is beyond our perception, even beyond the, the capacity of ourselves to comprehend, yet we're invited into that realm, we're invited into that environment. So anyway, at the end of the previous Pasha, uh, Sav, Moshe instructed Aharon and his sons to remain within the confines of the Mishkan for a seven day period. So over that seven day period, Moshe himself performed all the duties of the Kohen Godel, of the high priest. So, so this seven day process began on the 23rd of Adar. Now according to Rashi, uh, Moshe would erect and dismantle the Mishkan tent every day. So he comments on that in chapter 7, verse 1. So this eighth day is the first of Nisan. So when the Mishkan was erected permanently and the Kohanim were officially inaugurated. So we see that uh, how the end of this Pasha reads, beginning in chapter 8, verses 35 to 36. So at the entrance of the tent of meeting, they are to remain for uh, day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die, for so I have been commanded. And Acharon and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by Moshe. So that's how the previous Pasha ends. And again... This is something that Rashi will, of, will often come back to. Rambam definitely will always talk about the importance of understanding what comes before to give us context of what we are now in. And the questions that come out of that, because sometimes it doesn't seem to make sense why one thing follows after another. So what follows in this Pasha is the description of what happened on that day day with all its sacrifice and ceremony. So in the first portion of this Pasha, Aharon is instructed to bring a calf. Now this is interesting as a side note. So this is an eagle. Now where have we heard this word before? The golden calf. So this is the moment they talk about where Aharon realizes that he has been forgiven for his part that he played in the issue of the golden calf and that the reason why he has to bring a calf in the first instance is to atone for his part in the golden calf so you will find that this is a unique a unique sin offering as every other sin offering is a male goat as you will see in verse 3, when the congregation is instructed to bring a male goat for a sin offering. So the congregation as well as the sin offering are instructed to bring a lamb for a burnt offering, a bull and a ram for a peace offering and a meal offering mixed with oil. So there are a couple of elements in these verses here that I'm going to focus on. And the first part you'll see is that I've highlighted here. For today, the Lord will appear to you. So there's something quite remarkable going on here that I want to talk about. So let's look at the, the text of what he says and what the Torah says here in verse 4. Ki hayom hashim nirei aleichem. So ki, because, or it will, for... Hayom, this, the day. <laughs> Remember, this is the 
eighth day. This is Shmini, the eighth day. Ki hayom Hashim near a Hashim will appear to you. So um, Aleichem. So Aleichem is the to you. So to you all. So you can. So we can see as well in verse four that these communal offerings are because. Because ki hayom Hashem near a aleichem for today Hashem will be revealed to you, and what I want to point out is that this is there's, there's there are some amazing things going on here, to that tie into what was happening with Avraham. So you'll notice there that I've got on the screen um, from Bereishit chapter twenty two verse thirteen. To fourteen, that this is the the famous episode of the the binding of Yitach, and as the story goes, uh, Avraham is willing; <laughs> he is willing to offer up his the son of covenantal inheritance. It's not his only son, because of course there is Yishmael as well, but the son of covenantal promise to Hashem, and Hashem says no. He sends a mess, sends a messenger, sends a Malachim, an angel. And his hand has stayed, and then there's this really interesting thing happen where Avraham lifts up his eyes, he looks, and he beholds. He sees something, and he sees what does he see? He sees a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So we see an amazing connection going on here. The usage of near ar, the usage of near ar as uh, will appear or will will be seen. And the, the use of year A with Avraham when he is, is speaking and naming a place. Naming the place of encounter and the capacity to see that which is beyond the natural. See this amazing, the, the amazing use of language here to describe the, the interaction of what is going on on the eighth day. The potential that happens because of our response to God. And there is another place that I want to sort of point out to us that's quite remarkable that talks about the potential of what happens because we respond to Hashem, because we believe of our capacity to engage with the eighth day, to be able to come to these places, this place of where the, the fusion of heaven and earth exists because of the way we respond to God. And that is in Psalm to Helam 36, and particularly it's in verse 9. But I just love this particular part of Psalm 36, and it's something that turns up in the way, in the prayers, the daily prayers that are attached to the putting on of the zitzit, the putting on of a tallit, the, the, the prayer shawl as they're called. So when you put on the tallit, this part of the psalm is something that you repeat it's it's an, oh, just an, a, a wonder it's just a wonderful way of engaging with the nature and the provision of that environment i mean just listen to the language how precious is your steadfast love oh god I love this. The children of mankind, Uvne, <laughs> children Adam of Adam, Betzel, they they are in the shadow, Betzel of Kanefecha, sorry, Kanefecha of your wings, the shadow of your wings. Wings, <laughs> and what? Why? Because Yehe Sayun. It is the place where mankind takes refuge. So the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. <laughs> God, I just love this language. They feast on the abundance of your house, or you. They will be satiated by the delights. <laughs> By the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink. Venachal adanecha tashkim. You give them to drink from the river of your delights, or the the river of bliss. So this is this word here. Adanecha. So 
the Nahal and and the river. So Nahal is a like a stream. Adanecha, so your bliss, your delight. So this is the word Eden. You know, it doesn't sound like it, but this these are the, the letters for the term Eden. Gan Eden. It's, literally, it is the place of bliss. So look at the what look, look at what we're engaging with here in the environment that is provided to us because of our capacity to come into the eighth day. It's that environment of bliss. And it says, Ki imcha mikochayim, for with you is the source of life. And then here's, here's where I want to get to. So here's this word, near a, okay? Be orecha near a or, in your light, in your or light, we will see or we will have the capacity to see or light. I like to read it as, by or in your light, we see light. And so again, there's amazing connections going on here. And I love how what's happening here in Tehillim allows us to engage and come into a deeper understanding of the environment, of the environment of this. So, coming back to my notes. So what makes the usage of Nir A in this verse? What makes the usage of Nira unique is that Rashi indicates that this is the moment where all the congregation will see the evidence of Hashem's Shekhinah come to rest in, the, in their midst upon the Mishkin and that it would manifest there continually. The continuous resting of of the Shekhinah upon the Mishkin. So you'll note that this connects to the ram of Avraham's burnt offering upon Mount Moriah. So they're, what are they asked to bring as well? The, the, con the whole congregation? It's not just a sin offering, but there is a peace offering, the ram of the peace offering as well. So in verse 5 we carry on and they brought what Moses had commanded in front of the tender meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. So they took that which Moshe had commanded to the front of the Ohel Moed and approached the entire congregation, and they stood before Hashem. So it is this verse, this is this verse, verse 5, where we see all the congregation come into the witness and agreement that they all can draw near to stand before Hashem. And this, uh, to me, this is just wonderful. This is just a wonderful picture of what it means to walk with Hashem and the, the, the fruit of that, of allowing Hashem to guide us as we are always going to come to this place of drawing near, of approaching. And it's the heart his heart is for everyone. When I when I when I look at this word for congregation, and you can see it here, so we have here Kol Kol Ha Ada. So this is all the congregation. The Yam the Yam do and they stood Lifne. Now, Lifne literally means to be to towards the face of Hashem. So this is why it's translated as before, because when you're looking at a person's face, you are standing before them, and you are looking at them. So it's just, again, wonderful interplay, relational interplay here of the whole congregation. And and as I was saying, whenever I look at this word, hey, ha'eda, so eda or edut, it's literally the witnessing. A people, a gathering of people who are witness to something. Oh. And that is, uh, I, I just, you know, I just believe with all my heart that this is the, the longing and the desire of Hashem for all of humanity. And, and again, why why do I have this idea? Again, come back to what it's what it says here in Tehillim 36, 
where it says uvne adam uvne adam it doesn't it doesn't just isolate the term B'nai Yisrael, the children of Yisrael. It's Uvnei, and all the children, all the sons of Adam. So every human being, every human being can dwell, Betzel Kenafecha, in the shadow of his wings. They can, they can find that place of refuge. So it has to be about all of us. This is all about humanity. And what I find also remarkable about this moment, just coming back to the context, is that the because if you recall back in Pasha Ketisa, uh, chapter thirty-three, verses and verses eight to ten of the book of Shemot, this is where we saw that moment, that moment of longing of the the congregation, all the people when they would. So Moshe, what does he do? He's moved his tent outside the camp. And he does this journey going from the from in the camp outside. And what would happen? The people would come and they would watch. So this is after the, the golden calf issue. And they know that things that things are precarious. And they watch Moshe. They watch him and what happens at his tent. Where the Shekhinah comes upon that tent and talks with him. They look at it, and and to me, if you recall, I talk about the longing, in the, the emotion that's in that those passages. It talks about their longing to be able to do that, and look what is happening. Look what's happening here. This is the moment of longing that we see in Ketisa thirty three verses eight to ten is now realized. This is an amazing moment. Oh my gosh, how. <laughs> How amazing is Hashem? This is an amazing moment. Even though they can see that there is a defined protocol and elevated requirement of responsibility for those who serve in the Mishkan, regardless of their perceived status, anyone can approach to stand before Hashem. This is this is this. I this is the heart of what I feel is coming through in these verses. All the congregation, kol ha'edah vayar amdu, all the congregation came and they stood lifne Hashem, and they stood before Hashem. <laughs> oh, yes. So this is why we see this, the nifal, which I talked about earlier, the nifal near Ah, because drawing near activates reciprocal vision. Reciprocal vision. And look at what it says in verse 6. <sighs> that the glory of Hashem may appear to you. It really should be um, translated as so. So the glory of Hashem will be revealed to you. So that revealed to you will be the glory of Hashem. V'yir A. Let's hear it in the blue. V'yir, again, again, here's this. Now, we're seeing again the, the root of this is Ra'ah. So it's the same the same verb as Nir A that we see here. So Nir A, sorry. Keep defaulting back to near a because because I'm so used to praying and and talking and speaking and engaging with that word near a beor beor with it beorecha beorecha near a or by your in your light we see light so there's a different light that's being revealed here but again get me back to what I'm talking about near a it's the same verb it's just in a different Vowel, sorry, verb conjugation. Vayira, vayira here will will appear to you, and he will appear alechem to you. What will appear? Kevod Hashem, the glory, the glory of Hashem. So this this verse here in verse six, this is the statement that Moshe uses to clarify to the people. 
to the congregation that they were now able to realize the desire of their hearts to be able to draw near and that this is the result that that is the result of their continual movement towards him towards him again it's reciprocal it's responsive we near are we perceive because we are willing to draw near the mechanic that facilitates that process is the Corbin. And I, again, I must emphasize Corbin, the, the, the essential meaning of the word Corbin is to draw near. It's not what you bring, it's because you are bringing it. Very, very important. So this brings us to a very important question. What is more important to Hashem? The Corbin or the person, persons bringing it. And really the reason that I ask that question, or, or why I believe this question is important, because it really does, it brings us to the heart of what is happening here at the beginning of this Pasha. Because a lot of people tend to overlook the, the importance of the congregation in all this. Because the Vayikara, the book of Vayikara, is, a lot of it's about the, the role and the, the protocols of the Kohanim and the Kohen Godel, the high priest. But the congregation, the congregation, they are, that, that they are the people that the heart of God is yearning towards. So what is more important? And again, Corbin drawing near. It's not about, and to me, it, the, the lambs, the goats, the meal offerings, the peace offerings, the sin offerings, uh, all these things are to facilitate coming near. That's just, I mean, it's a, it's a deep, it's a complex, and it's a, it's a wonderful conversation to be had. And that's why I want to ask this question, because if we look, there's some really interesting verses that we find later on in, in Tanakh, outside of Torah, that really speak to this idea of what is, what is the heart of God here? And I think this is the most important thing. When we study Torah, what are we trying to, what are we trying to engage with? What are we trying to connect with? We're trying and believing that we connect, can connect with the heart of God, the heart of Hashem. And that in learning that, what are we, what are we encountering? We're encountering His desire. And His desire is for us. So just quickly, let's look at these verses. And I'll let you think about this. So 1 Shmuel 1522. And Shmuel, so Shmuel, it's not Samuel, it's Shmuel. Has Hashem, had, <laughs> does Hashem take great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than than sacrifice and to listen the fat of rams. What it says in Micah, with what shall I come before Hashem and bow myself to God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with a calf and with calves a year old? Is that my motivation? I mean it's wonderful, wonderful language here that the prophet Micah is is using. Will Hashem be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? <laughs> listen, listen to the response here. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with with your God to heal him 51 16 17 for you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it you will not be pleased with a burnt offering the sacrifices of Hashem are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O oh God you will not despise so, we, so what we can take away from these verses in connection with 
the Parsha Shemini, and especially just the beginning of the Parsha, where it talks about this drawing near, is that we no longer have a Mishkan. We don't have a physical Mishkan. We don't have a physical Beit HaMikdash. But what does remain? What does remain is the yearning of the heart of God for our hearts to respond to Him and to continue to draw near anyway. And that it's the language of our heart as it responds to God that pleases him the most. That's the, that's the arena of our conversation, heart to heart with Hashem. And that we find that beyond the cycle of nature, there is this place where heaven and earth meet place of the fusion of heaven and earth that is an amazing domain of our engagement with God so just in closing let me just re-emphasize a point that I raised earlier in regards to the use why why this word and why really why it fascinates me so much Near ah, why near ah is so important to us? Because drawing near activates reciprocal vision, and it's this place, this place of invitation, where the 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 continual presence of His glory abides, that is made accessible to us because we choose to draw near. Because we choose to allow our hearts to be captivated and inspired and motivated by this, by these verses and by the language of Torah. And that really it is for the congregation is all of humanity drawing near so that we can witness, be a witness of the wonder of who God is. Baruch Hashem. Shalom, shalom.